Good evening, dear friends. Welcome, Sonam. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It is really a privilege, truly an honor, um, to have you with us this evening. Uh, before we actually start this evening, I would like to uh, welcome especially our uh, first-time guests to this space, to this wonderful space that we call home. Um, it is um, essentially a school of philosophy by the name of New Acropolis. And I'd just like to spend the first few minutes introducing this concept of New Acropolis to you. Um, the school of philosophy um, said to be in the classical manner. Um, it, uh, it has three essential pillars. The first is that of philosophy, philosophy in the classical manner, meaning philosophy that is not uh, influenced by trends or by fashion, um, opinions or beliefs, but it's, uh, it's an eternal concept of philosophy. Um, philosophy literally translates to the love of wisdom. Wisdom um, meaning the, the fundamental questions that we ask ourselves. What does it mean to be a human being? Why are we here? Where are we going? What is our purpose? And um, ancient civilizations um, have asked these same questions and offered advice, offered answers, offered their own experiments in the form of culture. And that actually forms the second pillar of this organization. Culture is the human heritage from around the world, from um, different times of history. And it is, I would say, the trials and errors um, of, of human civilizations. I would say it is the ability of human beings uh, and different civilizations to interact with life around them, to celebrate the seasons, their harvests, um, special ceremonies, um, and trying to look for those laws of life that manifest externally beyond us, um, trying to look for them also within. And the third pillar is that of volunteering, which I think um, has a specific focus, a specific um, highlight for today's event. Volunteering because uh, for the true philosopher, for the, true, um, for the person who truly is driven by a need to change the human condition, to improve the human condition, um, you cannot help but want to share uh, the ideal uh, of this ability with as many people as you can. Um, and the idea is that uh, the moment you have started dealing and investigating with these questions of the meaning of a human being, um, it is a natural next step to then offer your reflections and your, your interaction with answering these questions to other people around you. Um, Sonam here is a, is a great example, um, who has this, this concept of the inner fire, this, this need, this drive to change the world. And uh, in a beautiful way, in his own way, uh, he's been able to give us an example um, of one way to do it. And um, therefore, I think it's, uh, it's a remarkable opportunity to um, get, gain some inspiration and uh, perhaps use it as a, as, a, as a means to evoke something similar in our own lives. So without further ado, I uh, welcome Sona Ubay um, to take away the evening. Thank you. Thank you, you Ariyanda. Can everyone hear? Yes, is this clear? Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to briefly introduce Sona. Well, uh, I was just trying to quickly put together all the things that Sona has, has really achieved in his uh, lifetime. And I got four pages of information. And uh, it's difficult to uh, really speak about everything he's done. But I'll, I'll try anyway. Um, in to really speak about Zonam is almost to understand uh, a little bit about the history of Ladakh itself. Uh, and Ladakh, uh, the place where it is, is quite unique. Uh, Sonam was born in Ladakh in uh, 1966. And uh, at the young age of uh, 22, when he uh, finished his graduation, uh, he uh, got this, he, he, he came across this concept that uh, it wasn't. It, it didn't come across. It was very evident that only five percent of the students who really appeared for the uh, the metric or, we, or what we call the uh, the tenth standard board exam actually pass in Ladakh. And uh, this was something that really came to Sonam as, as a drastic shock. And you would think that have I got this figure wrong? No. It's it's five percent that actually pass, not ninety five percent that pass and five percent that fail. And you'd wonder why. Well, it's, it's a variety of reasons, and uh, I'm sure uh, you can read a lot more about it. But in brief, it had a lot to do with uh, 
the, 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 the way that Ladakh is placed in between uh, Kashmir and, and Pakistan and has a lot of influence of Urdu. So the people of Ladakh, uh, until uh, they speak Ladakhi uh, in, their, in their households, and uh, until the age, uh, till standard uh, eight, they, just, they are taught in Urdu in, in schools. And they were until it changed. That's right. Until Sonam uh, had a role to play in that. Until uh, the standard eight, they were taught in Urdu. After the eighth, in order to appear for the final exam, they were introduced to English, and for two years they were given all the textbooks in English and uh, were expected to uh, appear for a board exam and uh, expected to pass. In Sonam's uh, own words, it's a miracle that even 5% pass. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, he, he claims is the intelligence of the people of Ladakh, who, even considering that you don't speak this language, you don't speak uh, either Urdu or uh, uh, English on a day-to-day -day basis, you're expected to pick up the language, study it in school, and then go and give a final exam in another language altogether. So this was something that really uh, hit Sonam really hard. And at that point, uh, he set up uh, an institution along with uh, a few of the friends. Uh, uh, Sonam, if I'm, yeah. Uh, it's, it was called uh, SECMOL. And it, it, the whole form is uh, Students, Education, and Cultural Movement of Ladakh. And their main aim was to uh, really try and reform the education system in Ladakh. Uh, try and make it more relevant culturally to the students there, uh, more environmentally uh, friendly, more culturally friendly to the students. And uh, he started off uh, with having this institution. In 94, he realized that just by having people come over and teach them was not enough, he, he thought it was important to go and speak to the government and go and bring about this change at, at the government level. And 90, in 94, he launched the operation New Hope which uh, its main aim was to overhaul the public system in Ladakh. And this was in cooperation with the government. They invited uh, Sonam uh, to come and uh, help them localize and help uh, the, the students pass. Surprisingly, not surprisingly, uh, in, in 96 or 97, the, the pass rate converted to 55 to 60 percent. This, you can see that uh, just by spending a little time understanding what it, it, you can understand that uh, the problem was you would think that none of the students in Ladakh were serious they, they were all um, not interested in studies and the, the teachers would be losing interest actually the problem was the system itself you often need to take a step back and really understand that it's not the students who are, who are the problem and they don't want to study you need to really go out and understand what the problem is. Um, beyond education, uh, Sonam is an engineer by training. And at SECMOL, he uh, has uh, <coughs> actually intended to make the campus an ideal uh, setup where it is a completely sustainable campus. With that, the temperatures go down to minus 25. A lot of us can't even fathom what uh, zero degrees are today. When it's uh, 12 degrees in Bombay, you, we have our monkey caps out and you know everyone's sitting at home. Minus 25 is, uh, is, is, is cold. Uh, Sekmol uh, relies on no fuel for heating. The buildings are designed in, uh, in a passive solar uh, kind of design where uh, it traps in natural heat coming from the sun. And uh, even when it's minus 25 outside, there are ambient temperatures maintained inside the building naturally at around 24 or 25 degrees. I myself uh, would love to go and see how it's done. And the, he uh, does hold, SECMOL is a learning center. At any time, there are about 100 students and volunteers there at the center learning how to build in passive solar, build with local, local materials. Beyond uh, simply just building right, uh, Sonam has doesn't seem to stop. There's always something more that challenges him. And uh, today he's dealing with uh, the problem of water in Ladakh. You would think that up in the Mimalayas, glaciers, there's always water. Unfortunately, they have similar. It's, 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 a, it's a cold desert. During the winter, the glaciers form and they freeze. And at the time when uh, it's time to sow, in the, in the months of, uh, it's a slightly different from here, so you have to understand. 
during the months of uh, March, April, and May, when it's the right time to actually sow, the, the spring time, the, the, gla the, gla the glaciers are still frozen. And there's not enough water to support uh, the sowing. So again, uh, Sonam uh, take, thinks about what can we do. Uh, the, if everything is always freezing in the, in, the, in, the highland, in the highlands, how do I get water down to our level when we need it? By the time the glaciers actually melt, which is April, May, the sowing season is already passed, and it's uh, you, the crop is very short life then, because again uh, the winter will start picking up in September. So the, in order to increase the growing period, uh, Sonam has come, come, come across this very interesting concept of creating localized glaciers, where he uh, the flowing water when it is falling, he traps it. And uh, you have to understand that minus 25 water will freeze anywhere. So rather than having just a stream frozen, uh, there's, there's a very interesting uh, technology Dilip was uh, sharing with me, that uh, he takes the water and he starts uh, transferring it out. The moment it actually moves away from the, the flowing stream, it starts freezing. And uh, uh, creating a 100 foot um, tall glacier. I'll explain that. OK. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I obviously he's bashing the board and I think I'm... No, no, just to get the... The, the technicalities. Yeah. Okay. So beyond uh, the technicalities, I think uh, we're going to move into what really drives Sonam. What is it that uh, has uh, pushed him to identify what was always the need for of the moment? When, it, when, it, when there was a need of education at a very ground level, what could he do to take it, uh, to fix that problem? When there was a need of people who didn't have uh, enough water or the right kind of environment to stay in, what could we do to fix that problem? Obviously, uh, I'm going to now hand over to Sonam. I think uh, I will not do any, enough justice to uh, to say anything. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, <coughs> but Maybe I think before that, I can add a little bit to explain that. Sure, please. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for this uh, detailed uh, introduction. Um, I just add a few things, and of course, it would be good to have questions answered also from you all. So, thank you very much for uh, bringing me amidst you, uh, a group of concerned, caring, and thinking citizens from Mumbai. I feel honored, and I thank Dilip, uh, who's been in touch off and on for the last 10 years. Uh, he's been coming to Ladakh, and he's been telling me about this group of late, and I was very curious to know more. I know very little, but I'm learning a lot, and I'm happy that there are groups like this emerging uh, in today's you know, times of uh, problems and challenges of global scale. Mm, having said that, I'll come to a few, few additions uh, and just to get some facts correct. Uh, the, yeah, one of my, I have two parts. One is education reform which was a calling in Ladakh when I finished my engineering, which is my, the other half. That's my, you know, personal passion. Uh, but I had to keep it on back burners to address the bigger calling of students that I, I saw, as he said, mass failures and so on. Um, so I got involved in bringing reforms in the government school system where most of Ladakh and most of India studies. I believe that until and unless we do some justice to our government schools where the whole of India, except for a few, study, we won't as a nation get anywhere. I was just saying today to somebody, it's like, you know, a train, the engine can't go far without the body of train uh, you know, left two miles behind. You have to go together. You can't think that 
5% of a nation will go too far when the 95% are left. Sadly, I feel, in this country of ours, 5% may have educational opportunities better than Europe or America, but the rest of the 95% are worse off than Sub-Saharan Africa. A country cannot do much, leave aside, uh, you know, being at par with neighboring China and East Asian countries. We can't. So my effort has been to bring some parity, to do some justice to this education mess in government schools. So that is one part. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if this would be the right time and the right uh, amount of time to explain what all uh, we've been doing, maybe another time, uh, to bring reforms in education. Suffice it to say that it was partly to help uh, the state, the government, deliver quality, but that happens only when people demand quality. So it was partly to help people, villagers, citizens, demand quality education, to raise their awareness, to raise their priorities from subsidies on rice and gas to quality education of their children. So unless you do these in a balance, it doesn't work. If you only uh, make people demand and not help the state, then it amounts to instigation. There'll be only conflict. But to help the state deliver while the people demand, then you may actually see some delivery. So that has been our mainly our effort in education, making people own, take ownership of the schools as a, as a source of one of their higher priorities, changing their priorities. And in a democracy, when people's priorities change, is when the system changes. We may go to a minister or somebody and impress upon that leader to bring some changes. They may, but the next one is going to wipe it all because it, unless it is a people's priority. So our approach has been to go to the people, change their priority, even if it is a longer route, it is what sustains. So much so that the government changes, but the new government looks at the people and sees that this is going to not help at all if we give them rights. They are all demanding education. We have to give them good quality schools and good teachers. So come which government, if the people's priorities are right, right things will happen. So that has been our approach. Regarding the engineering half, uh, for, uh, for a decade or so, I did very little because I was very occupied with the educational half. Then there came a time when after having done something for teachers, uh, capacity building, textbooks, we redid all the textbooks that made no sense to Ladakh, we republished, and now the government has taken over and they supply these textbooks that, I, that children in Ladakh, and a minority, not only cultural, linguistic, but climatic, geographical uh, minority, they can relate to. So we redid all the textbooks uh, now in the government schools. They, to use those, training teachers and rebuilding many schools, and so on. Um, there came a point when we saw that textbooks are okay, teachers are okay, but the buildings are so pathetic that in minus uh, 20, the buildings are minus 10, you know. Things freeze with inside the classroom. They can't even bend their fingers. How could they be expressing what they hardly learned you know, of that? <laughs> So little will come out when your mind doesn't work, when your hands do not work. And there have been researchers in uh, Scandinavia and the USA that says that there's an optimum temperature at which children's and even grown-ups' uh, minds perform. It may differ from place to place. In Europe, for example, it would be roughly 22, they found, degrees. Beyond that, colder or hotter, the mental performance level goes steeply down. So here you have a region where very poorly trained teachers, very poor books, very poor system in the government, and then you have buildings that add to it. So that's when uh, I started thinking of making buildings that at least do not 
subject them to this uh, torture. So that's when I uh, started using my mechanical engineering to design school buildings that are built with earth, the ordinary earth right under your feet, therefore cheap and available to everyone, rich, poor, well. Um, and using sun as the energy source. Again, another um, resource that's free for all. Nobody is metering, no big corporate. And then if you have the human resource, the human hands, you can put the two together and have a, a comfortable habitat or school or institution, wherever. So that's when I designed and created uh, some schools in Ladakh and this campus where we are, which he explained, where we use uh, no other fuels except uh, sun for heating in these winters, for cooking except standby because sun you can't 100% rely. So yeah, we have standby gas also, which we are also changing, uh, replacing with wood that is our own plantation, therefore renewables from our own trees. So we're, we're also working on efficient fires like rocket stoves that, that can use our own wood, burn super efficiently, and even the exhaust uh, makes bread, it runs an oven, can do pottery and things like that. So we're working on those also, I won't go into those things. But that, there came a point where technology could be used to, to solve some of these. So I started designing uh, schools and campuses using these materials. So that was uh, the technology part. And yes, um, it's not 24 degrees centigrade, but you're right. This is what 24 degrees would be to Mumbaiites. Yeah? <laughs> 24 to Mumbaiites would be going by the scale. Uh, you said we feel uh, shivering by 12. Uh, to us, it will be 14 degrees. So our, our target is 14 degrees in the evenings. Well, 14 is not um, a grand, uh, you know, global comfort uh, levels, but we don't believe in that. We, we believe in the middle path. Yeah? We don't want our houses to be sub-zero like most of the village houses are, but then we don't also want them to be plus 22 and 24 inside like the Americans would have, for which they'll burn all the fuel that is for generations, in this one generation. So rather than putting on t-shirts inside a house when it is minus 10 outside, we don't mind putting on a pullover or a jacket and celebrating a, a middle path where you can come down from 22 and you can rise up from zero or sub-zero, where you can achieve uh, dignified comfort without costing the earth. So that's what we believe in, roughly 20, 14, 15. This the figure is important not just as a figure, but also as a, as a, a belief and uh, you know, thinking a philosophy of middle path. So that's why I added to that. And regarding the glacier, just to add to it, because it would be not easy for you uh, to conceive, um, yeah, we have a problem of shortage, acute shortage of water, but that's not real shortage. It's only, like he said, April, May, when there is shortage. Come June, there are floods as the glaciers, big glaciers melt. So it's these two months, the bottleneck, that is a challenge. That leaves uh, more than half of every village dry desert. Had they had water, only for these two months, some extra, they would all be green. Um, so the, I, there's been a traditional idea in uh, glaciers, our ancestors used to do, and uh, one of our seniors in Ladakh has been doing, uh, Mr. Norfield, many of you may have even heard of the, he has been doing artificial glaciers. But the problem with that, he has told me many times, he's an 80 year old engineer, is that they are horizontal glaciers. You, uh, you freeze it like you described. You uh, divert the canal stream and let it freeze. That has some problems and therefore what I'm doing now. The problem is that when you freeze horizontally, yes, water spreads and freezes, but your storage is over a huge surface area that's facing directly to the sun. And sun with its 
roughly one kilowatt per square meter can easily melt a horizontal surface. It's very powerful for that. But in this new idea, what I'm trying to do is store it vertically. Vertically in the form of a cone or a mountain going up to 30 stories or so. And when you have a cone of the same volume, as I don't remember, 20 times or so smaller surface area for the volume you're storing when it goes up towards the sun itself, then the sun can't find the surface area to uh, act on. Yeah? So it's all coming towards itself. Or you could say the top is shading the bottom and therefore it's shaded by itself. So this is what we did a prototype last year. The principle is very simple. You know, all mountain villages have a source of water from glacial melt waters that melts in winter also. But since in winter nobody needs it, this is a significant amount of water that goes waste into the Indus River in winter, just because nobody is using. So that is a lot of water that's going waste. And if you freeze that during the winter, then you could use that as the frozen thing melts during April, May. That's the, that's the trick. Now, how do you freeze it during November, December, January, so you can use it this? There's a luxury already that Ladakhi people don't need to make huge reservoirs, which are so expensive per meter cube. Yeah? A reservoir is a very expensive way of storing. We have the luxury of storing it in the sky, which is only possible in a very cold, otherwise disadvantaged place. So that's what we do. And how you do is very simple. It's school textbook science. Huh? Water maintains its level. So when the water comes from a higher uh, source, you just pipe it underground, two meters underground, pipe it for a kilometer or so, and thereby drop, have a drop of head of some hundred meters, for example. And then the pipe, you can imagine if there was a telephone tower, you put the pipe along the telephone tower, it can go up to hundred meters because water maintains its level and it would drop from that height, right? And when it is minus 20, or with wind chill effect, it would be minus 50. The water would freeze by the time it reaches the ground. That's the simple idea. In fact, you don't even need a telephone tower. That was just to make it easy for you to imagine. It's solid ice, so you freeze one meter, and then the, the pipe with some technology goes higher up, another meter, another meter, another meter. It can go up to 100 meters. And that's a huge mountain of ice. We did a prototype last year so with it's seven it's meters. So based on that, this winter we are working on this. Uh, if I may interrupt, sure. It's all Bombay people. If you give all your secrets away, then <laughs> no one's going to come to Ladakh. That's and they'll start creating their own prototypes. Here. I would save, like that. Save, save a little like bit. That. Save a little bit. The technicalities. Let them come to Ladakh. I think they will enjoy it more there. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. Sekmal is a wonderful place. Uh, I believe it's open to public, and uh, a lot of people can. Uh, Dilip goes there uh, every year, he spends a few months there. Well, uh, coming back to Bombay, uh, since you are here, and a lot of people uh, want to really, uh, really understand a little bit more than uh, all the wonderful work that you've done. Uh, what uh, has, you know, you've done so much great work, and you, as you said, you have, you had personal ambitions of, uh, in, of always wanting to be an engineer, not wanting to be, but learning. Yeah. Yeah. Never wanted to work as an engineer for somebody, but I chose it to, out of curiosity. You, you're, uh, you, you like the, the idea of, uh, of uh, what engineering yeah, yeah. offered to the world. Uh, and at the same time, there was a calling, uh, much strong calling for education. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a difficult time. I, mean, uh, I would say, did you find any was it a, a time of conflict for you uh, that, what should I really do? Uh, is, was it something that you said that, was it there ever a choice that you had to make that I want to do this, not want to do this? Yeah. What we want to know is uh, what really drove you to make the decisions that you made? Great, thank you. First of all, why engineering? Uh, engineering was the trend, but I didn't do for that, uh, strangely. I was in my 12th class and I was, encountered this 
chapter on concave mirrors and I was fascinated by that. And then I wanted to learn more and I asked some elders and they said mechanical engineering is where you go for this. So I went for mechanical engineering. So that's how I chose. And then education, I had some conflict in, in my family with my father who wanted me to become a civil engineer because there are so much jobs and all that. And you can see I, why I chose engineering was for those concave uh, mirrors. How could I do this, this concave mirrors in civil engineering? So I protested and finally I had to leave the home uh, with no one to pay for my education. And that's when I had to fend for myself. And the only skill I had was my little science and things. So I started teaching students and students who were failing by their thousands. Yeah? So that's when I came across what they faced in education. So that, therefore, it was more from seeing and feeling for my students that the system has to change. So they were so brilliant. There was nothing wrong with them, but they would fail. So it was the system that was failing. So in that way, no. But yes, it has always been a... Normally people say, you have sacrificed this and that and so on and so on. No, I have sacrificed nothing because it has always been a joy. And what is a joy is not a sacrifice. Sacrifice is something you don't want to. But when it comes to uh, playing with the things that I wanted to after having done engineering, yes, I feel a little bit. I had to keep it aside and I had to do uh, more work in education, which I never thought I would be doing. So there, for the passion I have for things, a little bit of sacrifice. but. Jobs, no, I never wanted, I don't know what I wanted to do, but jobs was not the reason why I did my engineering. So yeah, there was some dilemmas, but then I thought, uh, I was more moved by the plight of the students. So it was not that difficult also. It uh, was the call of the moment, and it was something that came naturally to me. That's wonderful. Uh, so along your your journey, you've spoken about uh, going through education, you've been uh, dabbling with engineering. Uh, you've had several obstacles along the way. I'm sure it's not been an easy path. Uh, what would you say, a few tips for people who really want to go and make a change in society? Uh, you're, you're in a school of philosophy. Um, people are really here trying to make a change within themselves, mm -hmm. trying to make a change within society. If you had any uh, suggestions um, in, in order to help people on the path when they are trying to make a change in society, very often, uh, you know, society ten, tends to weigh us down with a lot of obstacles. People give up along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be uh, some suggestions that you could make to uh, yeah. people who, you know, to keep on, to do the right thing that you see is the right thing and not give up at any point? Yeah, uh, like most people, I had many difficulties and challenges, yes. Perhaps a little more than the share I deserve. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, ranging from general problems to getting into problems with the, with the administration and the political system, and even to the extent of being uh, labeled or actually there were FIR saying I was an anti-national with Chinese connections. You know. When government feels disturbed, they can do anything. So to that level, there were there were like warrants, FIRs, they could come to arrest me and so on. But th that was just the range of things. But uh, generally, I would say in my life, this is personal experience. Normally people may find sayings from this or that. My personal experience is that whenever a door closes, there are several that open, you know. It's so much so that you you wonder what would you have done if you hadn't had that problem. You're so grateful to that problem that so many interesting other things start happening. But you have to keep you have to have the balance of mind to to look for those. Okay, this door closes, but what are the others opening? But often people become so depressed or down that they don't look at these huge doors, the rest of the doors. They get obsessed with this one single little door 
that closes, I've always been very grateful to my problems. And I'm not just saying it as a rhetoric. I actually am very grateful. And each time they open even bigger opportunities. So I would say, yeah. And what is life without problems? It is like cricket without wickets, volleyball without a net. Okay, you play, but it's like a little children's game, you know, when you play without a net, with badminton or whatever. These are what makes the game interesting. And what is it without them? So, take on. And, and, and take, don't take, li I would say, don't take life too seriously. Take it as a game that, where, where yeah, these problems are a beautiful, interesting part of them, is what I would say. A little easier said than done, but my experience, I would really say, yes, this is what makes it interesting. Thank you. Uh, well, Mahatma Gandhi uh, is often quoted saying that you need to be the change that you want to see in the world. Would you uh, like to narrate a few changes that you had to bring about within the way that you view life or the kind of way that you dealt with several things that eventually would were brought about first within you, and then sort of you, you saw that you know this is automatically opening up outside you. Hmm. Yes, so, I mean <clears throat> to convince anybody of any possibility of change, the, the speaker must profess and show that it is possible. Of course, nobody would uh, follow or believe unless under some obligation like in government service, uh, services, you, you have to follow the line. Otherwise, in normal life, nobody will. So I, yes, believe in this saying, be the change. Um, generally, like, address the real issues of the land. So in this case, education. So I, you know, not without pleasure, but left my whatever you would call it, career and so on, so people could see that he means business. He, there is a problem. <coughs> Similarly, smaller things, smaller things, but significant. I'm very concerned at this stage about what is becoming of our earth and our cities. It was an ordeal getting here this evening. No, no breaking uh, two hours of driving. No breaking because we had to be here in time and the traffic was that I could walk much faster than the car. So I've been saying if we if we all, you know, didn't use cars so much, it would be it would be so sim so much simpler for everybody if each one used bicycles or walk. And to say that, I think one must practice it. So I have always been on a bicycle for, I think, four or five, uh, long back, but more so in the last <coughs> four or five years, so much so that I carry a little bicycle wherever I go when I'm alone. This time I didn't because I was to be with people and it doesn't help if the others don't and I can't go too far alone on a bicycle. <laughs> so uh, even from Kashmir to Ladakh, I, bicycle yeah so uh, I think it's, it's a beautiful way I mean in Delhi I find regularly that I'm way faster than cars and as good as the metro and get stronger uh, healthier I won't I won't have metro bills and I won't have hospital bills <laughs> so so I think there needs to be some change in these cities you know it's Pathetic. I was just thinking when I was in this traffic, I was thinking if people in Mumbai spend one hour like this in the morning, one hour like this in the evening, two hours a day in an active life of say 50 years, you are up for 16 years, rest you are sleeping. Of that 16, two hours, that's like 12 and a half percent of your life, uh, over a 50 year active life, you are spending six, uh, six years. In the traffic. <laughs> what life is that? <laughs> yeah. So I don't need 56 years. 
Well, uh, you you are uh, not only are you losing the six years, but then breathing the pollution. You your six years are already gone <laughs> for those reasons also. So uh, it's strange. I I I don't feel comfortable with the idea of cities itself. But so today I had a good slice of it to believe even more. <laughs> we should spend some more time. It's not so. Good. Okay. <laughs> All the best. Um, more relevantly, we have a lot of people who have uh, come to uh, from the education background. So what would you say is the uh, role that uh, society or the view that of uh, the society needs to take on education? And uh, what are your comments on the state of education today? Mm. And what pertinent changes do you see that we can come about uh, in the role that we as citizens play in influencing or viewing even the way we view our education system today? I see two important roles of education in a society. The first, a very basic one, is to help people fend for themselves, you know, basic necessities of life, to survive and live and have enough to eat and so on. That's the more basic one. And then to reach higher potentials within, you know, to actualize your own potentials in the mind and the spiritual path and so on. But I am sad to say that today we are not even fulfilling the first one, the basic one, which our ancestors have been doing throughout the centuries and millennia helping their young fend for themselves. Farmers train their children to farm, similarly other professions, even animals. This is interesting bringing, coming to education, just remember this. You know, I hear this playway method of education, you have to do the child-centered, play-based education. We make a big deal out of it. And I think even cats do that. You know, have you seen a cat, how it brings up, raises its kittens? It plays with its tail as the little mouse, because it has to train the little kitten to survive. It's all playing away. They never train their kittens, you know, when you see a mouse, pounce upon it, when you see a mouse, pounce upon it, when you see a mouse, pounce upon it. They just make them pounce upon the little demo mouse they make out of their own tail. That's a teaching aid and an activity-based active learning that's happening right before you and you call them animals, but they practice it all the time. And so was it with our ancestors. You actually engage them in farming, engage them in carpentry, whatever it is. I don't know what's wrong with modern civilization. We cage them in a dark and dingy or maybe luxurious even, room and make them read about everything and without really knowing, understanding anything. And then, okay, it's a different time, it's a modern time, city life, fine, but you don't even train people to be useful even in that life, you know. You may finish your graduation and post-graduation, the real training happens in the employee's factory or the firm. They have to spend two years to make you, what do you call, useful. You come with a big certificate. You know. <laughs> and the real real learning happens in whoever it is, Tatas, or who. They have to have educational programs to make this crude thing with a certificate into something useful. We're not, we're not even doing that basic thing. I think education has to be hands-on, practical, ready to, after having spent four to six precious years of your life, you should be ready to go the next day, you come out and you should be going. So I think there are big problems. And the second part, even farther away, the you know, inner growth and actualization of our human potentials as a human being. These other things are animal also. So in the lab we try to say, Rather, rather than um, the three R's of education, we should go look at three H's of education. Yes, a bright head, like most school.
schools are obsessed with, but that's where they end. That's the problem. A bright head for mathematics and chemistry is good, but you have to focus on skilled hands also, which is what our schools don't. The best of schools may have some thing on the skills of the hands, but then skills hand in itself is not enough because the people who blew up the twin towers had very skilled hands and very bright head. The kind heart is, unless you have that, your, your two can be misused, but when you have a kind, compassionate heart, nothing can go wrong. The world will be a better place. I think that uh, sums up. I would like to open the floor to a few questions. Uh, if the public has any for someone. I just want to ask you, you know, this phone thing, you are not very clear how does it help eventually. That is I would love to know, please. So that's it. I'm sorry, for I lost the mind. But still, I don't want to go back home without, without a clarity. <laughs> that is a technical question. I, I will ask... Uh, how does it help? Huh, like vertical, how does it help save water or get water? There? In short, it's just storing water right. Up in the sky because that's cheap or zero cost almost. And then when it melts through the spring, the trickle melting is what you use for the farms. That's all. You mean to say the sun affects better in a cone? Uh, cone uh, no, sun doesn't melt it. With, uh, okay, maybe I'm just not good at explaining. <clears throat> if you don't do that, it melts too quickly before you need it. Premature melting. But if you do that, it lasts till May or so. That's when you need it. You don't want it to melt too early. You want to store it till when you need it. And that's what uh, happens when you have it like that. It doesn't melt too quickly. Your aim is not to melt it, but to not melt it till May. Okay. Some other questions? Yes. There was uh... Please, go ahead. I wanted to know what is spirituality to you, or how do you connect with the sacred? No. We need another hour session for that? <laughs> <laughs> no, please, please. I'm not um, in a big way into spirituality and things, but I do try to keep a balance of, uh, within myself and uh, to be positive and to be out of, you know, uh, negative vities and uh, practice some meditation, etc. for bringing that balance. But other than that, I'm very practical. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm spiritual. Could you help the, the three ages? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, yeah, it works out. Yeah. 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 I had a question. Uh, how many months in a year uh, is the sun uh, out in Ladakh? 300 days. 300 days? So yeah, it's one of the most sunny places so, on the earth. So the solar energy is being harnessed to uh, yeah. use? Uh, yeah. In what way? How, how you got solar panels? And no. Uh, the Yes, also, but uh, the biggest energy consuming part of your life is houses. It's okay. not the lights. They are tiny. What really consumes energy, I think 50% of world's energy is consumed by houses, not cars. And emissions, 40% or so, is also houses. So uh, after that, maybe cars and vehicles. You know, to heat places in like Ladakh and to cool in places like Mumbai, it's a huge amount of it. So the biggest use of uh, energy is for heating in our place also and for that you don't need panels and you know factory made industrial products you just need to orient the building right to get the most of the winter sun and not the summer sun and that's very easy you face it south and both happen all the sun comes into your house in winter and none in summer in the northern hemisphere it would be the opposite in the in Australia, for example. So all you have to do that. After that, you just use the right materials where it is going to receive the sun. You put dense materials like rammed earth where it is behind the back 
north back of the house you put insulating light materials like straw and clay or industrial materials like glass walls and so on and you capture the sun store it in walls and then keep it till night that's the simple principle it's all passive that's why it's called passive solar then yes for electricity we try to use uh, I think I'm okay. <clears throat> so I was in Ladakh when the cloud burst happened, mm -hmm. and thus that topic is very close to my heart. And uh, I've, you know, tried to understand a little bit about what people had to say about it. A little bit maybe from you, who's a local, mm -hmm. on was that really a work of man because of over exploiting uh, the ecology of the mm -hmm. region? or was it really a work of God and thus really it wasn't about the excessive cultivation and farming that might some people might consider uh, that's happening in Ladakh? No, no, that, that was, uh, to me, that was life as normal as it can be. If you look at glacial periods, Ladakh has been full of flash floods every 200, 300 years. Uh, you can see every village is sitting on a flash flood or glacial moraine. So you, you can see flash flood signs everywhere. In a place like Ladakh, with uh, dry deserts and uh, possibilities of you know sudden cloud bursts, you will have flash floods. Frequency may be more now. I don't know. Frequency may be more. It could and should with all the deforestation happening, which all, which all, sometimes people say like, there's afforestation in Ladakh, but I think more the deforestation in the Himalayas, the clouds don't uh, precipitate there and it comes over into Ladakh and then precipitates. So the frequency, I'm sure, must be higher, but Ladakh is not new to such flash floods. Okay. And there are enough evidences. So what is wrong and why this has become a problem is because we humans are dumb and build where the floods come. So our ancestors never built in the valleys. They built on the mountains or higher levels and kept the lower levels for farming, which is good for production of food, but if there is a flood, a farm goes, not a house and human. Right. So now with what you call cities, again, land prices are so high, you build right on the path of the flood, and then you blame the flood. Okay. <laughs> Dear Saman, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thanks Dilip for insisting, telling me that uh, it's an opportunity that we should not miss. And for me, it was a pleasure, I believe, that, and for most of the students here also to to hear uh, in each and every sentence that you said an echo to what we teach here, what we learn, uh, which we consider the philosophy of humanity, not a certain philosopher. Financial philosophy. I also have a question for you. Uh, to me, it's very, very clear that uh, after also seeing some videos and articles that uh, Dilip was kind to share with me, hearing you today, that you are the, an example of what we call an idealist. Someone who follows the needs of others, not only the needs of himself. In a society where we, I believe that uh, the focus is not there, the focus is on the need of the self. Um, it's also very clear for me that uh, if in Ladakh there were 10 people like you, or more, then Ladakh would be in a different place. If in the society would be more people like you, society would be in a different place. This is a challenge that I don't know if you are also dealing with, but I believe I heard something from Dilip that you are also looking to develop leaders or idealists. Can you, can you say a few words about that? Mm. Um. more connected to the rest of our work uh, it's it's to address both what you said and also the the young people who the society and its systems reject as failures yeah? so like you were saying at 10th grade level they're failed by their hundreds huh? now maybe 30 percent only earlier 95 percent so at our institute as alternative school we try to take the failure. This school is very different in that the qualification is 
that you have to have faith. Uh, then we take two. If you have passed, we'll consider <laughs> fat chance. <laughs> and then we try to make leaders out of them. Yeah? Failures to leaders. Because they are perfectly good and sometimes it's because they are bright that they fail, they don't fit in the system.